I'd like to welcome Bob and Ken out. Uh, these two individuals were invited by Mike Jones. Um, they're going to talk to us today about internet scale identity, collaboration, and higher education. And they will be covering some of the, their experiences on this for the next 40 minutes. And then afterwards, we'll give some time to you for Q&A. So I'd like to welcome Bob and Ken. Bob. All right. Um, let's see, just a little bit of background about uh, who, we are and who we are and where we're from. Um, while my computer thrashes. Um, well, um, let's see, we are from an organization called Internet2 uh, that is a consortium of a whole lot of universities, 250 or so, essentially all the big universities in the US. Um, membership organization also has a lot of, uh, of uh, corporate and other kind of partner members, uh, among which are, is Google. Um, so you know, two does a whole lot of different things. The main thing that it does is uh, that it's known for is uh, high-speed networking and research in uh, advanced uses of high-speed networking. Uh, so it's running, you know, multi-gigabit, super-duper, you know, lambda division, blah 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 networks all around the country, peering with. Uh, with uh, things around the world. Um, <clears throat> Ken and I are not from that part of Internet2. We are from something called the Internet2 Middleware Initiative, which is working on uh, uh, promoting uh, identity and access management best practices and new approaches and research and cool stuff uh, for uh, all those universities and lots of partners around the world. So that has focused on uh, a number of different things. Uh, we've had a PKI initiative, like everybody has had to have. Um, <clears throat> a web sign-on, done a lot of work with SAML. We'll be talking a lot about that. Uh, and federation, uh, directories, all kinds of stuff. Um, so uh, we're, we are here, uh, again, at Mike's invitation. We uh, got involved with, uh, with uh, Mike Jones <coughs> sorry, around uh, the use of uh, uh, SAML and the, our Shibboleth software for federated access to Google Apps for Education, which is uh, obviously uh, a big interest for uh, those of us in higher ed uh, that uh, led, uh, uh, among other things, to uh, Google being a sponsor, financial sponsor of the Shibboleth software project. That's our main Internet2 middleware software project. And so we're appreciative of that. So Mike suggested that we might come here and talk about this stuff because people are interested in uh, authentication and authorization, where it's going. Certainly, we're uh, extremely interested in, in following up and uh, having conversations or even you know joint projects or whatever that might turn into. That's what we're supposed to do in Internet2 is promote that kind of thing. So, with no further ado, um, a bunch of things. Uh, federation has been a big deal for us for a long time. So a lot of what we're talking about is where we're at with actual reasonably high security federation among a lot of parties uh, in this country and around the world, um, and how our SHIB stuff fits into that. A bit about user-centric stuff because you know it's it's all the rage, and. Uh, uh, even though somebody said it should be banned from, from use and banned from talks, here it is. Um, I'll be offering uh, you know, inflammatory opinions on things like InfoCard and OpenID. Um, we'll be talking some about how that, how that relates to what we do in higher ed. And then shifting slightly some work that we're doing on uh, support of collaboration and how that's done, um, uh, how we, we envision that to be done, and what the requirements are for supporting access control for collaborations across a huge spectrum of stuff that we do in higher ed and how that relates to uh, group and privilege management in particular. So. Um, Internet identity, I think uh, I'm told that, uh, that people here are pretty savvy with this stuff. Um, who can name all seven of Kim Cameron's laws of identity? <laughs> Nobody? Oh, come on. Um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, perhaps people have been exposed to that. Um, I think this, uh, this stuff is, uh, is pretty common across uh, a lot of people looking at, at this, you know, 
people want to want to sign on less, uh, you know, no, you know, fewer usernames and passwords across all those darn websites, uh, you know, across all those blogs that you want to leave comments on. Um, it's the hot thing these days. Um, privacy is a big deal for us, and uh, we think in uh, in the world in general, uh, you know, just because you want to. Uh, um, be able to sign on to lots of things doesn't mean that you that all those things should be able to to uh, correlate all your activities and track everything about you all the time and so we want to build an infrastructure that supports people's interest in in that kind of disconnection um, uh, <clears throat> there's uh, uh, as we uh, uh, as we have, uh, institutionally, and a lot of a lot of what what we do and we are talking about here is uh, from an institutional perspective, we are representing the interests of our you know 200 uh, uh, top end universities and more broadly higher education and research in general. These are you know substantial enterprises with enterprise interests, but also interests in supporting collaboration in the world. So to do that stuff. We can't just have a one-size-fits-all identity scheme. We, you know, we have, we know, if we're dealing with alumni, and you know, we support 100,000 alumni at my university. They're, they're, you know, the the ways of dealing with them and their identities is going to be different than our financial officers or our medical researchers or anything else. So we need a range, um, ease of ease of deployment, ease of use. Stuff has to be able to get out there um, in order to be useful. Um, so a, uh, an entirely too simplistic slide about, uh, about uh, dividing the world into federated and user-centric, sort of based on you know, what's, what's actually happening out there in the world today. Like I say, we'll be talking a lot about what we mean by, uh, by the federated space. Um, <clears throat> you know, in, in broad terms, uh, federation typically means uh, taking advantage of some sort of large organizational identity management system and being able to extend it out to work with partners outside the enterprise. Um, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, you know, often that just means the ability to sign on. We've put a lot of effort into uh, uh, going beyond that to actually send uh, user attributes. Uh, we have all kinds of important elements of business processes that can be um, uh, enabled by that. Uh, and uh, we'll be talking more about that. Um, again, you know, if you're talking about an organization dealing often contractually with another organization, then you know, off, often this will be associated with a contract or or some other kind of of, um, of arrangement. And you want to make sure that you're doing the right thing with your uh, institutional policies. So this stuff can be difficult to get arranged. Um, there's a whole user-centric world. People are no doubt familiar with. You know, open ID is kind of the uh, the uh, the <clears throat> The hot topic these days, you know, just set it up, be, be promiscuous. Uh, you know, it, it's you know we, what we want is is for people to assert their own, their own identities, not necessarily be tied to organizations. So those cases are things that we'll be going into more, and they're both growing, right? Even though you know, uh, uh, you know, some people would like to say that uh, that SAML is dead and, and other things. Uh, you know, what we see in, in, in our environment for our purposes and the communities we serve, that stuff is growing big time. Um, so, um, um, and I will, I will zoom through here. Um, um, again, making the point that uh, uh, the federations. Now, uh, I'll change change the meaning slightly of the word federation here. Federations, as we have come to use them in research and higher ed, are not sort of bilateral as they as they almost always are in the corporate world, where you set up an arrange, arrangement with some kind of outsourced supplier, and that's it. Um, <clears throat> we are are forming and and growing multilateral federations. Um, we'll be uh, giving more information about that in a bit. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that serve a whole community, right? Creating a community around not just the identity providers, as we are acting as as, as big universities, but also the the service providers that are out there that are consuming that stuff are also part of our community. We're forming that stuff together and developing the arrangements, which again are often you know are, are obliged to be contractual, uh, you know, specifying the responsibilities of the parties in order to build those those things. <clears throat> uh, all right. Um, 
So a bit about SHIB, uh, a software project that has been going on for uh, six or seven years now. We just released uh, 2.0 beta today after uh, an uh, entirely too long gestation period. Um, widely deployed, we are, you know, mumbling about maybe a thousand sites or more at this point around the world uh, using using SHIB. Open SAML is the library component there that implements SAML has been adopted, we believe, uh, you know, under under the Apache license by a lot of, uh, of other open source and commercial products for doing SAML stuff. Um, uh, <clears throat> Should, we, we have been focusing on getting to the SAML 2.0 specification, the main, the main uh, uh, shibboleth uh, uh, architect. Scott Cantor was also the main author of the SAML 2.0 spec, knows it pretty well. Um, so we, uh, we believe we'll be delivering a, a pretty good implementation. Um, and uh, again, there are lots of, of ways to do SAML. Uh, any particular implementation might support some. Uh, and uh, 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 we think that ours will do a lot of those and be able to provide a lot of glue for a lot of people. Um, uh, one bullet point there is that uh, that we are seeing the beginnings of support service business because enough people are deploying it that they are prepared to pay money to folks to uh, to make it happen. So that's a good thing. Happy to do more of that. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, Federations, uh, as I was describing, are happening. Uh, it's a, uh, a fascinating thing that they have, uh, that while we've been pretty successful at growing stuff here in the US, uh, internationally, um, they uh, have, been, uh, have been growing even more. Um, let's see. Um, let me uh, mostly skip over this one, Federations. Uh, uh, when we are trying to build multilateral uh, <clears throat> federations at a technical level, have to agree on all these things. So part of what we do as, as uh, the in common federation, uh, and let me just uh, skip to that right now. Uh, let me just show internet2.edu is uh, the organization I was describing. Here's the in common. Federation page. This is uh, again serving. It's uh, <clears throat> operated by Internet2 <clears throat> on behalf of, uh, of higher education in the U.S. and our partners. Uh, so um, has a whole lot of participants. Again, uh, you know. There are 3,000 higher ed institutions in the U.S., and our market is all of them. So 44 is uh, better than 1%. <clears throat> uh, but we think we've got the uh, many of the most important ones, uh, uh, big schools that carry a lot of weight with uh, with uh, their peers and with vendors. Uh, so these are all places that have uh, done all the uh, legal work and setup work to. Uh, uh, technical setup work to participate in the federation. Any of them is able to uh, to uh, uh, sign on without further ado to any of these resources out here. Again, developing more of those all the time. Um, and if you care about our policies and practices, there they are, et cetera. Okay. Um, let me change that now. So the federation, then, part of what we do there is make sure all that stuff happens, basically solving that for the entire community once, <clears throat> rather than each of them having to do that separately with each of the, each of the places that they want to federate with. Um, policies are uh, a big deal in this stuff. Uh, if you, as people, you should know if you've ever got into this, you know, the technical part takes a while, and then you hand it to the policy people, and they take a really long time. So uh, a lot of what we do is to try and create a framework for, for what the policy should be uh, uh, among organizations. A lot of that is knowing what not to set policy on, what to leave to, uh, to contractual arrangements that might be uh, arranged between, uh, between uh, uh, members uh, separately from the federation itself, building on it. Um, uh, some of this involves uh, standardizing attributes. Uh, we had done a lot of work prior to forming in common on a standard vocabulary to cover uh, basic elements of what we thought would be interesting uh, about uh, people entries between uh, um, interorganizationally in higher ed, and that was able to be applied directly once we were able to um, use uh, SAML to do that. 
and uh, it's called EduPerson, so that's been widely adopted um, both in, uh, in the US and, uh, and uh, uh, internationally. Um, levels of assurance is another big deal. Again, I mentioned uh, the, the notion that that one level, uh, one you know, uh, sort of level of risk management and and uh, cost applied to uh, the assurance applied to users doesn't cut it. So uh, we, in particular, have been driven to do stuff uh, in that area by our. Uh, uh, work with the U.S. federal government, which cares a lot about levels of assurance and defined four standard levels that have become widely used across the the biz. Uh, you know, from some points of view, they care care a lot more about it than is good for them. But they are the government, so they tend to care. Um, so uh, 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 that is another uh, uh, emerging element of what's going on in our uh, federation agreements. Okay, so here is. Uh, a, uh, a slide of uh, uh, showing growth and adoption in a particular uh, national federation, higher ed federation in Switzerland, run by the National Swiss uh, Research and Education Network support organization, SWITCH, uh, essentially showing uh, from 2004 to 2006 more or less uh, 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 complete uh, coverage in the uh, higher education space there. This is something that is has been pretty uh, straightforward for the European uh, uh, National Research and Education Support Organizations to accomplish because of their, you know, their, their, their national support structure for those activities. It's much easier for them to say, we're going to do this and, um, uh, and get that, that level of coverage. We don't have that kind of uh, national level of support here in the US, for better or for worse. So we are invited to, uh, to, to grow uh, by persuasion rather than by, uh, by uh, a government mandate. Um, but uh, uh, there are... Uh, uh, deployments in uh, in all those countries listed there. Uh, they take different shapes. They're all they're not all using the same kind of software. The Norwegian one, for example, uh, using the uh, the Sun uh, product in a centralized deployment, not doing it in a sort of per campus distributed federated fashion like we are here in the U.S. But they're able to participate internationally uh, with uh, a number of, uh, of providers. Um, and uh, what, are we, what are we doing with that stuff? Um, a lot of different things. Uh, one of the focuses uh, initially was uh, uh, access to, uh, to licensed library content. So big providers like Elsevier and their sciencedirect.com site that essentially everybody licenses. There's a lot of access problems around that stuff that aren't met by the, uh, the IP address method that is typically used today. Federation offers a good way to do that. Those providers have been pretty good about jumping on the boat. Still a ways to go with that stuff, but the, the, big, the biggest international use cases for, uh, for federated access have been those, uh, those providers. But there's a lot of others too. Um, uh, you know the, uh, the music services that uh, uh, have come and maybe gone now, uh, Napster, et cetera. Um, uh, serving campuses have been a a, a big uh, a big use case. Other just uh, service providers in the higher ed sector, homework handling, uh, plagiarism checking service, uh, um, career uh, references, all kinds of things that are serving our market that uh, uh, where federation applies. Um, Google Apps for Education, in fact, is one of those, and uh, uh, we uh, have been working on on that coming on and joining the federation for a while now. Um, and I think we are uh, we are nearing completion on that um, uh, uh, one one of these one of these weeks here soon. Okay, um, so uh, uh, I uh, I showed the in common uh, site. Here's a little bit more about it. Um, again, just serving the U.S. We have found it useful to uh, to have these federations be uh, nationally based. Uh, again, a lot of the, the things with just you know dealing with with policies, privacy policies in particular, uh, and and making contracts are much easier if you're if you're dealing with it uh, uh, nationally. Um, although, of course, there are lots of lots of international use cases even with the U.S. Uh, universities. 
Um, <clears throat> there is, you know, a governing body. It's a real, it's a real activity with lots of, uh, of uh, administrative help and lawyers and all those things to keep it going, support staff, et cetera. Uh, uh, <clears throat> again, uh, we are estimating uh, coming near 2 million users, counting everyone uh, available from all those, uh, all those universities, uh, again, all able to do strong, reasonably strong authentication uh, 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 across the system to all those providers. Um, a significant one that uh, uh, is coming on soon also is the National Institute of Health uh, with a number of different applications that um, National Library of Medicine, et cetera, that are important to higher ed. Uh, again, that involve dealing with quite a bit of federal government policy in order to get NIH to, uh, to sign up. But they're very excited and are leading the way, in fact, with, uh, uh, with a number of other agencies that we're interested in. Uh, so we're excited about that one. Uh, another, uh, another member that uh, will be joining soon is our good friends at Microsoft, who have a, uh, an application in software distribution that uh, we think will be pretty popular. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's definitely getting there. Um, Want to show the wiki? The wiki? Uh, okay. Yeah. And this might be the time to show the wiki. Um, our sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, most <clears throat> visible, uh, uh, highly federated application is uh, 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 our uh, instance of uh, Confluence uh, Wiki, which has been uh, federation enabled uh, at Internet2. Um, so uh, again, just, uh, just, another, just another Confluence, but when I go to log in, if all works well, if the demo gods are on my side, then I am presented with you know, the, uh, the bane of federation, which is selecting uh, my identity provider, where I'm from. So note that this particular application is a, uh, a member of a bunch of different federations um, uh, in the US, UK, uh, Australia, Sweden, et cetera. So if I just want the ones in the US, then there's the list. And I happen to be from University of Washington, so I'll select. And now I'm presented with my, uh, my friend, familiar University of Washington uh, uh, sign-on page, or at least I hope it is. I hope I'm not being fished. Um, uh, I'm sure I wouldn't be. Um, so uh, I won't. Uh, well, what the hell? I may as well. So, now I'm back. And uh, so I'm signed on. Uh, notable that this site has about 400 users. Uh, 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 again, all federated. Um, about 40% of them are actually from an identity provider that is a really interesting thing. Uh, 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 here it is, called Protect Network. That is an open identity provider. Um, anybody can sign up, get an ID there. So it's really useful as we collaborate. Uh, if we say, if you're from uh, a Federation member, that's great. If you're not, go and get one here, right? It's open, no problem. Um, so about 40% of the users are, in fact, from this one. They have 60% from, from uh, real Federation members. Um, uh, again, about, about two-thirds of those, I think, in the U.S., and the other third uh, uh, international from all over the place. Go back to, if you go back to the dashboard for a second, I noticed that uh, Jeff Hodges had uh, been using his... Uh, um, right. Jeff was at VeriSign. Uh, actually, at... Uh, New Star. At uh, New Star. Yes, I don't know. Anybody know Jeff Hodges? Um, he's, uh, he's here. Must have been interested in our SHIB announcement. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, um, I think in the interest of time, well, maybe just to mention the, uh, uh, I've talked about some of the <coughs> things, the LOA thing. Um, uh, 
levels of assurance is a big deal in, uh, uh, as I said, in the federation space now. How do you, you know, given that that uh, uh, a uh, uh, participating site might be, uh, you know, any kind of site. You know, we have a bunch of universities, and maybe universities are all pretty good, and we all do vaguely the same kind of things. But there's Protect Network. What kind of place are they? You know, um, my at my university, we have we have all kinds of IDs. We have my ID that's you know pretty well. Uh, 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 secure, uh, you know, when we know that it, there really is a Bob Morgan and that really is his ID and he really is a staff member, et cetera. Uh, we also have lots of IDs that are handed out randomly for wireless access or whatever around the campus, you know. So it's important to us as running identity management in our, inside our site to be able to distinguish those somehow for application consumption purposes. The federation aspect of this ha has helped to structure that partly because of the our good friends at the federal government providing this uh, numbered LOA structure. So uh, uh, in common, it will be uh, defining those terms uh, for itself uh, shortly and uh, having some kind of uh, certification program. We're not quite sure how for sites to uh, uh, to uh, be, become accredited at one of those levels for particular elements of their community. And we, we think that will enable a lot of applications that care about higher assurance. Medical records in particular is a big, is a big thing. Um, uh, and things going on at the federal government, uh, grant management, et cetera. You wanna sure. do a couple? Yeah. And, and just one or two uh, comments that I accrued along the way. Um, when Bob mumbled about the breadth of uh, deployment, we don't honestly know because it's open source and people download and deploy. Um, when you Google on SHIB, um, one of the interesting things that comes up is there's evidently an extremely large deployment between the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice. And a couple of years ago in DC, I was giving shtick, and these uh, two guys from DHS and DOJ walked up at the end and said, we're really interested in your software. And I went, I hope not. Um, and, and they said, why? And I go, well, I'm from Berkeley, um, you know, and I came out in the 60s. Um, this is privacy preserving. And they went, no, this is secrecy preserving. We are now under federal mandate to share lots and lots of information between DHS and DOJ, and we want to do that. But it's not like we want to reveal our operatives to each other. We definitely don't. What we want to reveal is that we have a user who is authenticated at an extremely strong level of authentication who has the authorization to access the content on the other agency's site. So you know you're onto something when, you solve, when you're trying to solve privacy and you get a side effect of, of solving a, another problem that's important to people. So that was an interesting aspect. Uh, another um, thing, Bob was mentioning um, EduPerson. As part of our long and ultimately painful um, interactions with the federal government, Maybe that's redundant. Um, the, um, one of the things that we worked on was um, developing a US person object class. And all of you are good CS folks, so you know the, the famous saw from the um, CS community about there's only um, three numbers that matter in CS, one, two, and many. And it's metadata correlation, one, two, and schema. So schema have emerged as really, really important in this space. And so we developed a US person schema that it had, among other things, it had very little in it. We we're very parsimonious in our object classes. But one of the things that it did have in there was a full disability class, which turned out to be very important for the federal government, who has an obligation to present information to all of the citizens, regardless of their handicaps and challenges, and the fact that we had attributes that would allow still preserving privacy to be able to display things to braille readers or uh, to, um, to uh, vocal readers or to compensate for your color blindness or your learning disabilities was a very important tool. So think schema, as I'm sure you guys do. Um, third thing to note from Protect Network, et cetera, is that the, um, the transfer of this from enterprise to enterprise services to citizen to enterprise or citizen to government is a very important step in all this process. And we had fond hopes that ultimately banks would be identity providers. 
um, because they happen to have a trust relationship, they happen to have auditors, you happen to have a trust relationship with them where you give them a lot of money and they give you a piece of paper in, in return. That said, the banks have not fully stepped up to this um, um, business, partially because some of them are still waiting for the gods of PKI to arrive. Um, and um, partially because they're busy doing other stuff, but certainly some banks like Wells Fargo um, are deeply involved in this in helping to foster a, um, a citizen um, a solution. Um, lastly, as we get into the um, federation space, looking out your door, the University of California system has formed a federation, UC Trust, all the schools are in that, but they're also members of In Common, and so we're starting to handle some of these issues of uh, federation peering, et cetera, and for those of you who came from the TCPIP land, we're back to BGP one more time with autonomous systems up a level of the protocol stack. Um, the Cal State system is about to enjo um, uh, um, join as uh, 22 universities with, um, um, or 20, yeah, I guess the universities. Um, and they have a very important initiative called the California Digital Marketplace, which may reach this out to a lot broader community. So with that, we're, uh, we're now diving into uh, relationships among federations. Um, we had a meeting in um, Prague. Um, you really need to buzz through here. So. Okay, uh, yeah, so when we talk about, um, okay, the meeting in Prague was uh, 15 to 20 uh, uh, R&E federations, five continents now, um, all doing pretty much the same stuff. Um, some anchors out there are these uh, federal guidelines, NIST, 100, NIST 863 on identity proofing and acts of authentication. That gives us some common ground. EduPerson gives us some common ground. International privacy issues, EU privacy directives, et cetera, gives us some dissimilar ground, and we have to work through those issues. So we got together in Prague, um, lots and lots of alignment. It was really a pretty uh, remarkable meeting. Liberty was there. Um, you can see the topics um, um, we, we covered, um, privacy policies, which are right now distilling down to consent agreements, but ultimately as we were chatting back there, we have to worry about distributed denial of privacy attacks by having service providers correlate information about a particular identity that's come through the door. Shibboleth is pretty um, distinctive in its ability to um, uh, oscillate those identifiers so that you can't make those kinds of attacks, but that's an important aspect of this. Uh, dispute resolution, if we have international peering, where the hell do we resolve the disagreements? Do we go to The Hague? Um, we want to go to ACM, actually, is where we want to go, but we'll, 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 we'll talk about that afterwards. Um, the next steps in this process are the UK drafting an, uh, an analysis of, of the international peering agreements, um, and we're all moving. Um, as Bob indicated, we had a long and ultimately fruitless relationship with the federal government um, about the space, but. The relics that we constructed along the way are very important. So the SAML 2.0 profile for interoperability is moving into the eGov SIG. Um, the attribute schema is moving into the um, um, eGov SIG at Liberty. Um, and uh, we'll see if they're any better at it than the federal government. Um, we're holding judgment, but we're participating strongly. We'll participate with anybody in this space. Wanna, wanna, uh, I'll slide this back for a second. So um, uh, can we go up? For, actually, we. Uh, did you want to go before that? Yeah. Uh, just um, when w the question really is how heavyweight do you get this stuff along the way? Well, um, we'll get into the open ID space in a second. Very lightweight, almost vaporware um, weight. Lots and lots of good uses for that. Lots and lots of instances where you need audit, where you need um, um, the ability to, to, to track information. So the answer at the end of the day is going to be Lots of different kinds of identity, hopefully presented on, under a common veneer, maybe an info card, card space kind of veneer, some other kind of veneer. But we see these as very complementary, and we'll talk a little bit about how you can integrate open ID and federated identity. There, would, there is now a lot of work done where you can come in with a federated identity and go out with a, U, a URL of your choice. So with that, maybe I should turn it back to Bob. All right. Thanks. OK. Um, a, uh, User-centric, I think people here probably have some idea of, of what, what people say that stuff means. Um, I, uh, I don't uh, want to so much get into, especially since our time is short, get into uh, 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 details. Uh, obviously, there's a lot going on and, uh, uh, in, you know, in uh, two activities and representing universities. We uh, certainly are, are interested. I've been you know, <clears throat> attending all the IAWs from the beginning. Uh, et cetera, following that. Um, uh, so let me uh, let me just make a couple of points on this slide here. Um, you know what what are the what are the important things that people 
<clears throat> mean about user-centric. From my point of view, there, there really are, are two that are key. One is that, that you uh, have a, uh, a notion of owning whatever it is your identity is, as opposed to having it be tied to a particular app or website like Facebook, or even, even when you've you know, externalized the authentication and you know, I'm able to use RL Morgan at Washington.edu to sign on to lots of things like that wiki or you know, various other uh, externalized websites from the UW and lots of you know, a zillion places at the UW, but you know, RL Morgan at Washington.edu is still the property of the University of Washington. You know, as it turns out, I, I can <clears throat> most likely keep it for life, but that's the current policy, and it's UW that sets the policy on that. So, you know, there is, you know, as, as <clears throat> has been well expressed uh, at this point in many venues, a, a strong interest of people to have it be their own thing, not it be, you know, have it not be Google's thing or, or, or Washington.edu's thing or the government's thing or anything. I mean, me, you know, the identity that I express is mine somehow. Maybe that's, you know, the domain name that I feel like I own, even though it's probably really ultimately the property of ICANN. But, um, uh, you know, have it be mine. And, you know, yeah, you know, that's really technology independent, I would say, but is, is, a, is a real strong theme in that stuff. And the other is control of how information flows. So it's user-centric if the information that's passed between the parties that I'm dealing with goes through me as opposed to being done in some back-channel exchange between those places that I don't really have any a view into or control over, right? So those are, those are both important things. And I think, you know, really technology independent. I think a lot of technologies that we're doing are, <clears throat> are capable of supporting that stuff. A lot of it has more to do with, uh, with uh, policies of entities that are, that are involved in the, uh, uh, the technology than the technology per se. Um, that said, um, speaking for Internet to Midware and the Shibboleth Project, we are bullish on InfoCard. Um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the idea that you can have really good uh, <clears throat> uh, internet identity with everything happening via a dumb browser just only takes you so far. You know, having the ability to have actual smart software in your browser that knows how to sign on to things on your, on your platform that knows how to sign on to things really makes all the difference. So uh, we have been... Uh, uh, you know, even though you know some of the technical details in, in InfoCard and the identity meta system and all that stuff are not necessarily what we would have chosen, um, <clears throat> the uh, the overall system seems like uh, the best bet for actually moving things forward. Uh, so um, <clears throat> we are uh, intending to support that in the Shibboleth product, where again, not define uh, exactly what that would mean, but ultimately. Uh, uh, being able to uh, replace or supplement a, uh, the current uh, uh, redirection-based, uh, browser-based flow that I showed earlier with a, an info card-based flow retaining the same ability to send attributes and, uh, and relying on the same uh, infrastructure, um, uh, federated infrastructure to support it that we enjoy now. So that's our, that's our goal with that stuff. <clears throat> Open ID. I'm sure there are big. How many? How many people here have an Open ID? Everybody is. How many people have used it this week? Okay, a few. Um, not me. Um, uh, so uh, you know, Open ID get, gets a lot of buzz. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly, you know, fine for uh, for many uh, uh, great use cases uh, for which it has been applied. Um, you know, don't really have time to uh, to get into its uh, its details now. From from my point of view, having you know looked at it uh, a fair amount, you know, for for the kinds of use cases that we that 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 we are talking about, that traditionally talking about in the university space, the kinds of things we've been doing as federation, um, you know, is it securable to do those things? Probably, but then it would essentially lose most of its appeal because you know, the user would start have, having to manage their own uh, HTTPS website, et cetera. So um, you know, uh, OpenID 2.0 is supposed to solve many of these things. Will it actually take off and see adoption? Will the non-URL uh, use cases, which are some of the interesting things in 2.0, actually see the light of day and be deployed by people in the world? Maybe. Um, we'll see. Um, I have my doubts. 
from, from my point of view, from the you know, looking at, at what we're doing in higher ed, it's really the, the, the use cases here that rather than this exact technology, people want a promiscuous interaction, right? Here's a site. It's never uh, been in touch with or knows nothing about an identity provider, and they're able to interact and do something useful, right? Well, you know, to some extent, that's a you know a something for nothing proposition, right? You know, if you really know absolutely nothing about them, then you can't tell the difference between a really good one that's supplying you really good stable users and the one that's providing you with all the spam. So, <clears throat> well, if you knew some, if you have to know something about them, then you know, what do you do? Well, people are certainly are already, as people are here probably aware, working on a reputation system to support the, that kind of discrimination. Uh, you know, and I think in, in many ways that is what we are trying to build a, a portion of by building something for the higher education community is to say, okay, here's a whole bunch of places that can participate in a, uh, an, an open identity system that are universities. You know, you, you, you know, you may not like universities in general, <clears throat> but they are institutions in society, and they do represent a certain kind of, of, of reputation that is already out there that can be leveraged, as opposed to having to build it up from scratch. Uh, <clears throat> So, uh, but are those promiscuous use cases ones that, that are important in research and education? They absolutely are, right? What do we do in research and education? We connect up researchers, educators, all around the world based on their, you know, their interest in, in all kinds of, of, of obscure subjects, bring them together, and it's really important that that be able to be done in, in a uh, very loose, uh, you know, collegial, you know, non, you know, doesn't require contract setup kind of fashion, right? It has been done that way for, you know, a couple of thousand years already, I think. Uh, but it's important that that continue in the online world. So those cases are not really being met very well by these more elaborate federations that we've set up to do the, the higher value things now. So if we want to be able to play in that space, and I think it's important that we do, we need to find some way to bridge that gap. Um, on the other hand, you know, the kind of stuff that we do, you know, even if it's a loose, loose collaboration among researchers, you know, it, it's, an, it's real stuff. Your reputation as a researcher is, you know, it's, it's your career, right? If your, if your research is, is trashed by somebody who stole your ID because they did a, you know, a, a DNS poisoning attack, then, you know, that's a big problem, right? So, um, or if they get access to that expensive, you know, resource that you got from the NSF. So, uh, you know, we can't say that all of those are low value cases. Um, uh, ePortfolio, let me just touch on very quickly the notion that a student's stuff should be, you know, this, what students want to be able to do is collect all their stuff throughout their academic career someplace and say, here's my stuff, here's my academic stuff. This is a very big deal in, in, um, in the education space these days. People are trying to design systems to support this. Where is that stuff going to live? What's going to be the identity of, of that place, of you, of you when you are, when it's your stuff at that place? Is it going to be the last university you attended? Is it going to be the identity you started with in elementary school that carries on all the way through? Don't know. These are very significant questions. Um, <clears throat> in running short of time, I want to get to our next topic, but uh, all this stuff can be, uh, can be hooked together in fascinating ways. I did a demo at a meeting uh, over the summer where I went to an OpenID-enabled website, uh, uh, was redirected to an OpenID provider that was InfoCard-enabled, uh, signed on to that with an info card that was a managed card. So ultimately, I went back and signed on at my university uh, using basic auth. Right? So you know, we can chain these things together in really cool ways. And we have absolutely no idea what's happening by the end of that. Right? And people, you know, people <laughs> want to do that. It's really enabling to be able to, to do these things. But what have you got? You know, and when, when, you're, when you're done with that, you know, user support, um, you know, assurance, all that stuff. So, you know, we have many, you know, the nice thing now is that we have many, many, many identity tools that are in our hands. And the, you know, interesting thing is what are going to be the useful ways to put them together. Um, okay. So um, just our final thing here about collaboration and uh, uh, all the different things. So this is a big area of work for us now. Um, we observe that higher ed collaborations tend to involve 
several different kinds of tools all at once that wiki I showed um, you know for example um, you know mailing lists uh, uh, chat video conference etc cetera, etc cetera. all these things have to be managed independently for many uh, collaborative activities virtual organizations that are supporting these things that's a huge burden and it becomes uh, an impossibility to, to support a large uh, collaborative distributed federated activity using that stuff so we're trying to make a change in that uh, a lot of our peer organizations uh, supporting research and education around the world are working on the same kind of stuff um, we uh, uh, <clears throat> let me just Go right to this. We have a project called Co-Manage, which is uh, bringing together some uh, uh, group and privilege management tools that we had uh, been targeting for more enterprise space before, uh, federation enabling them, uh, applying them to the, this suite of collaboration tools, hoping to do some demos and uh, show how this stuff can actually uh, <clears throat> uh, improve management of access to resources, make it an, enabled for real virtual organizations, show some of that stuff happening at, uh, at Internet2. <clears throat> You know, obviously, as we look at things like uh, like Google Apps for Education and how uh, uh, universities federate into into those spaces and think about about uh, real federated cases there, where I'm not just going to uh, you know the University of Washington instance of Google App, Google Apps for Education, but somebody from uh, from some other uh, 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 university federates in to look at my calendar or share an email inbox or whatever. Those are the kind of things that that uh, we really want to. You know, we're excited about about uh, uh, you know enabling with the kind of applications that you guys are developing and uh, uh, trying to take advantage of the infra the identity infrastructure that we're building. So. Um, uh, uh, and again, you know, showing examples of, of, uh, of doing that kind of thing with, uh, with tools that we're building. So I think that's, uh, that's probably about it. And we wanted to leave a little time for questions, so we have a few minutes. Yeah. Let me just that was, a, that was a, a fire hose of stuff. I um, want to expand a little bit on this last point about um, when you plumb an application for collaboration and, and federation. The um, University of Missouri has um, um, shibboleth SharePoint. And SharePoint is a, certainly a widely used collaboration tool. And it's wonderful that you can use your federated identity from your enterprise to get into the SharePoint server. And all, all life is all good until you want to use one aspect of SharePoint, which is revving up a desktop application. And that desktop application has got to understand the federated space. And in the case of Microsoft's products, no. So um, understand that the, there are layers here that we're going to go through. We're going to get quickly to have you be able to access content on a shared server, but then to exploit the applications underneath to use that um, is a, a different trick. And I, I, I appeal to you guys as really smart people who do applications to make sure that your applications can understand life in a federated space. And it's more than just federated identity. It's, it's, it's living in that almost DCE type world that's out there. <laughs> what? Case of death. Um. <laughs> AFS type world out there. How about that? AFS, yeah, AFS is cool. <laughs> who, who else loves AFS? Come on. There must be some people out there. So let's, let's go into Q&A. We have time for a couple of questions. Hi there. Um, I'm wondering if you could compare uh, what InCommon is doing to some other uh, commercial identity federation services, if there are any, if you could comment on that. Commercial identity federation services. Um, are, are you asking if there are any, or are you? Do you have some in mind? Well, I know there are identity vendors like Ping Identity. So, yeah. Oh, but yeah, let me. But, I, in fact, I had um, I had coffee with uh, Andre Durand um, a couple of weeks ago about this um, space, and he reported. CTO, I think. He's the CEO actually CEO. of of, of uh, Ping Federate and Ping ID. Um, they have a lot of installations out there. 125 in the Fortune 500s. <laughs> Every single one of those installations is bilateral. Every single one of those is we've outsourced travel, we've outsourced payroll, whatever. Um, and he knows that that's not a Wait, real path I mean, forward. Do you know what you mean by bilateral? It's, you know, this company makes an arrangement with that company, they share keys, you know, set it up. Way so you there's go. no... You do the next one, you set up another server that, you know, do the next one, you set up another server. But, so. And, and so you can count on a contractual base already because you have, you, you've done that partnership. You can count on the fact that you don't have to worry about what attributes they're permitted to, to, to deliver because that's part of the contractual nature. Whereas when you move to a multilateral space, then you have to really question, is that enterprise really um, um, 
able to assert that somebody's a member of some other enterprise, for example. Or, uh, and the enterprise viewpoint is, why should I give those attributes out to these people? So a lot of stuff creeps in when you hit multilateral. Everybody, I think, now in the commercial space is understanding that the long-term path is multilateral. That's why Liberty glommed on to us so, so passionately is because we're doing the multilateral federations, and that's where, where, where the end of the um, story will be. So um, what we know about are large numbers of bilateral commercial um, identity providers, as it were. Um, we don't know of, of um, with the exception of Protect Network, and Ping Federate will probably join in common as an IDP, where in fact you might use your open ID to get to Ping Federate and then get out with a, a federated ID from Ping, Ping Federate as your identity provider, which leads to interesting questions about how can I add an o LOA to an open ID? Because I came in with a strong act of authentication um, perhaps to uh, uh, Ping Federate. Um, how, how can I uh, convey that information? So um, we don't know of any real use cases right now. Um, among the federations that are being um, constructed, perhaps the broadest is in the UK, where they intend to um, encompass all of um, higher ed, all of continuing ed, all of K-12, and now they're talking to the National Health Service. So um, that's going to be a very broadly scoped federation at that point, and we'll see how it, how, how it tracks. I think we're keeping a more um, um, focused view on our federation with the idea that pairing is the answer um, between federations, and we have to nail that down. I mean, there, I guess the, the one instance I know about of commercial identity providers actually was, uh, is in service of the, uh, the US government authentication federation, where the whole point was to push uh, identity management out from the, the government applications out to you know, the usual ring of, uh, of government contractors. And uh, so there are some there serving that particular set, but uh, to my knowledge, not serving any other markets. So um, it's a difficult space to be in, I think, you know, as a, as a business proposition. Uh, you know, <clears throat> liabilities unknown, uh, you know, but we'll see. And we want to be pretty blatant about our, um, our appeal here. It's, you guys have always been leaders. You jumped onto federated identity really early on, um, and that's wonderful. Now we're talking about a richer identity management space where groups and privileges, et cetera, can be exchanged across these, the, the, this fabric. And, and you know, our appeal to you is externalize as much as you can of identity management within your application space so that it can function in a federated world. There's smirks back there. <laughs> no? Oh. Well, there's one thing that strikes me is you're talking about managing identity for universities. Um, and it seems to me that Facebook has been doing that for you. They've been going around using emails, identities for university students and built that out. So is that competition for you or is that um, parallel? Is that not relevant at all? Well, um, let's see. Uh, uh, <clears throat> is, is Facebook competition for us with identity management? Uh, uh, um, I don't think so. Uh, I haven't heard of any universities that are saying, you know, you can now sign into your course website with your Facebook.com ID. Um, you know. Well, but it's uh, are are those are those services are are academic activities definitely moving out into the internet services absolutely you know moving it so it's not not so much identity as the actual you know the stuff itself you know how many how many courses are 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 doing stuff via Google Groups right and a zillion I'm sure right. Are, is that a concern of universities? Absolutely. You know, the, uh, you know, what you know, <clears throat> you know, uh, do we? Are, are, is there a level of control that we think we we need to have over that stuff? Well, in you know, the ordinary course, maybe not. The one that's dealing with, I don't know, possibly uh, uh, medical information because it's a medical course. Well, yeah, um, you know, so. Uh, 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 you know, I mean, obviously, you know, people moving serious work into Google Apps is uh, is a big deal, and that's you know, people are working on contracts around that. Um, you know, <clears throat> uh, uh, 
you know, I, that was sort of the point I was trying to make uh, in, in the middle there about, about you know, if we don't, uh, you know, play in the broader internet sort of, you know, application space and, and, and you know, via identity, then, then, you know, that stuff will just start to happen out there and, you know, uh, university uh, identities will be good for, you know, uh, you know, looking at your paycheck and uh, looking at your grades and, and that'll be about it, right? Uh, and I think that'll be a lose. I think, you know, because, you know, I, I really think that, that when it comes to academics and, you know, that reputation point that I made, you know, being out there with the fact that you are a professor at a university, I think, should make a difference in all kinds of online activities, right? What kind of difference? Well, you know, if we're building up reputation based on, you know, who likes your blog comments, you know, and that is determining your expertise about, you know, the, uh, the history of Azerbaijan, well, you know, how about actually being a professor of Azerbaijani history at some university? Wouldn't that help establish reputation in that? In, in that you know sort of sort of context, I think it would. How do we how do we get there? You know, we don't have any ways of digitally expressing that kind of thing today in a consumable fashion, but we're getting there. You know, we can say is faculty now in a standardized fashion. You know, so uh, you know that that's the kind of you know if we're going to serve our societal role here, that's what we need to do. An another aspect of the Facebook um, situation, Kevin, is, is um, whether it's authoritative on any attributes. So one of the big businesses right now um, within In Common is the assertion of studentness. That's huge. Um, Facebook can't assert that you're a currently enrolled student and so and so. Um, what we're seeing now is a vast marketplace from the, one of the, the um, uh, companies in In Common is student-only services. And they, they give you URL passes. Uh, one of the reasons we like them is their LOA is zero. <laughs> um, a comfort level LOA, as it were. Um, but they really want to know that you're an active student. Universities <laughs> spend hundreds of thousands of dollars today to service those requests via fax, via e email, via telephone. Imagine if you can have a dynamic probably process. probably still sending nine track tapes to some places. I suspect so. Um, and wouldn't it be nice if um, we can give a real time assertion that you're a student? Um, and preserve privacy in that prospect, and a lot of other things. Um, and that's turning out to be huge. And again, right. so it, it's not only universities as identity providers, but universities as definitive sources of authority for certain pieces of information. That's very important. So you know, if, if Facebook really yeah. was obliged by legislation to assure that people were students, well. Or made the distinction between alumni and, yeah. Or something. You know. And understand, especially as Bob talked about some of the then medical, we start charging them, right? me the medical applications, that um, um, there really is a regulatory life out there. Uh, we don't like it, um, but um, HIPAA, um, Gramm-Leach-Bliley, Sarbanes-Oxley, all of this stuff is real. Um, lots of economics associated with it. Um, we'd like to um, have an infrastructure that supports that but could be diluted down to be flexible for the uh, social networking environments, et cetera. But it seems very difficult to, to start at, at, at an open ID level and ratchet up. In defense of open ID, a little. Um, the thing about um, Facebook and the existing identity things have been built on email. And the problem with email is it's a, um, you're overloading a message sending mechanism. The nice thing about OpenID is you're overloading a URL, which means you can, once you've verified the URL, you can use that as a source for further information because it has a page there. So that means it can, it can point into the rest of the system. So that, that's a, it seems like a subtle difference, but actually it's quite an important one. Um, and obviously, sure. you know, we, we like URLs at Google because we go around indexing them. But right. um, I think it's valuable for other people as well to say, okay, if that URL is on, you know, the university domain, it has a path there, and that points to the, the other services that can be fetched from it. And if you, you know, if you can attach those two, then there's some value there, I think. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, the notion of of you know uh, URLs being associated with with identities as as one portion of a, of a set of identifiers, absolutely, you know. I like URLs, um, you know, makes a lot of sense. Although, you know, again, you know, what about, what about, uh, you know, privacy aspects, right? If, if I have to have one of those that says everything about me in order to play certain kinds of games, you know, to, in order to participate in certain kinds of activities, and if I don't, if I choose not to have one, you know, am I cut off? You know, what, what, what sorts of things, uh, you know, what, 
what, what is the expectation of, of everybody being open about everything you know, due to people's uh, legitimate interest in privacy. You know, we need to, to bear that in mind. Um, Final question, where can we talk about this stuff more? Do you have a slide on contact or? A fine, a fine, fine question. Um, go to the InCommon website, go to the. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, uh, certainly we have a lot of <laughs> material out there on InCommon and, um, and Internet2. Um, our, uh, our best university-oriented place for uh, uh, discussing identity management related stuff is, uh, oops, there's my screensaver. Um, nice bird in Australia. Um, is, uh, is uh, yeah, talk to the bird. Um, is actually, uh, there's an identity management list that's run out of uh, Educause, a uh, larger organization that, uh, uh, but uh, uh, good venues to talk about, about, about all this stuff are needed, actually. Um, it's, uh, and, and it's important to note that you're not an average company. We would give the average company answer of, uh, you know, join the email list, et cetera. You're Google. Um, and that's really important to us. Um, so if you want continued engagement, it's, um, um, it's kjk at internet2.edu. How about that to cut through? And we'll, we'll, we'll find something because you're, you are consequential. And we make, uh, you know, it's also remarkable to us and to the rest of the world that they, we have a project that Google and Microsoft are cooperating on. We want to keep that going. Okay. Well, thanks, Bob and Ken. Thank you. <laughs>